Another CEO Wisdom Pod with Ryan Schockner with us today, A Must Win CEO, uh, which is a very cool company. Brian's an author as well, and uh, he does a bunch of things, actually. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Ryan, and uh, I'm going to get into it right after that. Yeah, absolutely, Charles. Hey, I appreciate you having me on, and, and I'm excited. Yeah, we do a lot of stuff with personal finance and and athletes and brand building and and really teaching them you could probably best sum it up in athlete development all the way from high school to the pro level. What financial um, lack of acumen do athletes have and why? Yeah, I think it's important to start with the why, right? And so the reason athletes a lot of times have, uh, you know, there's multiple reasons, right? So it's not just one thing, but you, you know, as an athlete, whether you're in high school college, pro, how, whatever level you make it, you are focused on essentially one thing, being the best athlete you can be. And you specialize and you have special coaches and all of this stuff has really, you know, where it started at the pro level has trickled down to college, has trickled down to high school and has trickled down to, you know, middle school and grade school where these kids have these coaches, right? So they build this identity as an athlete and that's kind of their sole focus right so so that's really number one uh number two is you know if you don't have money then what do you really care about financial literacy and personal finance right so depending on where you're coming from and and your background and the environment you're coming from if if your family's never had money or if you don't have money then That's not something, you know, it's like, I don't care to fly an airplane. So why am I going to learn how to fly an airplane? Right. And no matter how much sense it may make to, hey, you need to learn about this financial stuff until you're in that situation where you need that knowledge. It's really not relevant to you. Right. And the thesis here being most of parents they invest a lot of their time and energy into their kids you know and they they invest like every single penny into them and the dream is kind of get into well out of the generational poverty which i just wrote a post about which is this super noble goal right it's like let's end that stuff it's been plaguing us for quite a while and athleticism is the way to get out of it and i i that's very noble i i really much um have a lot of respect for that i do think though that um personal finance is somewhat outdated and there needs to be new models out there for example a lot of people think in terms of <clears throat> money what about if you think in terms of energy they they most people think about in terms of of money but also in time but energy is like not really part of the equation so how much can I invest to gain that much back in energy, for example, is, is a model that I preach forward for athletes, especially if they're going to make it big. I'd also preach uh, for them to have their own brands, you know, open their own TikTok, their own Insta and kind of do their own PR if you want, you know, not only to get recruited, but eventually, um, and we're going to talk about that. I want us to talk in phase of the career, right? Because if we yeah. talk about NFL, if we talk about um, NBA, for example, like the athlete's lifespan is kind of short, yet, even in UFC. Um, and at me, at, I would preach them to to manage their fan base so that after their career is done, uh, they can still have a, a huge cash cushion, right? It's not millions of dollars that they'll see in their bank account, but it, it is something that they can convert into money almost instantly. Um so start is so talking about phases. Um, tell me because I, I've seen some uh, college association. I think that you're into. Um, tell us about the athletes' life phases and how do you help them align their financial goals with that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll I'll hit on a point that you made uh, before I answer that question, if that's all right. So it's the, you know, trying to end this generational poverty, right? Which I agree, I, I'm I'm all in favor of, right? But the, the view is that they have to do it through athletics. And while, and, and I hope that they use their athletic career, get as far as you can, right? Because 
I think what we know from, you know, the whether it's the pro athletes or the college athletes that have had t- tremendous amounts of success, they leverage, you know, outside of their sport, they leverage a lot of the skills that they learned and refined through athletics and just transition them into a corporate type world. And, and so as these athletes are chasing this goal and have this, you know, big, important why, right? This thing that they're trying to, it's not just trying to go play pro in whatever sport, it's trying to change the family legacy, right? So as they're doing this, they have to be aware that they are building skills that can apply to uh, life after sports. So it's not just this athletics that can get you out of this, you know, this curse, it's, it's business. uh, It's all this other stuff that can get you out of this curse. And if we started looking at what the, the pro athletes are doing now, you know, they're, they're arguably more successful in business outside of their sport than when you look at their entire, you know, grade school, high school pro career, um, and so it's it's highlighting that to where that these athletes don't think that it's just one way that I have that I have to make it out. It's multiple ways and to to then leverage their opportunities. And so then that kind of backs into your to your question of what are the phases, right? You know, we spend all this time, you know, focused on developing as athletes and, and our athletic skills and all that sort of thing. And now with the name, image, and likeness, what that has allowed is for us to, at the same time we're developing these athletic skills, that we're now able to also build and um, and use these other skills that we uh, are, are learning, whether it's building your brand or networking or connect, you know, connecting and building relationships with people that we can then leverage. Uh, while we're athletes or whenever our athletic career is done. And so it's really, it's that first phase, you know, working with all, all levels is identifying with the athletes. Hey, yeah, we're trying to uh, accomplish all these athletic goals, but outside that, who are you? What's really important to you? Um, who do you want to become? If athletics wasn't a thing, what interests do you have? What's unique about you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And let's really figure out um, and create a a level of self-awareness to where you're good with who you are. Being an athlete is just part of what you do. It's not who you are. And start building, you know, your athletic brand, but also some other brands uh, at the exact same time so that we can then leverage those um, to to, you know, break some of these generational curses, uh, regardless of the level you make it to as, as, um, an athlete. Right. You're talking about building skills here. Um, I think there's two curses and I mean, I'm checking the demographics of NFL and NBA mostly when I think about that, which I think is the core of high money-making athletes in the U.S. Um, and I'm talking about national level here, of course. Um, so pardon if I do, but that's where my my interest is, you know, like because I study CEOs and top, top, top performers. I think there's two main curses here. Like one is talent uh, because talent will only take you thus far. Um, I think they really need to build, you know, a skill set that a skill set is scalable. So discipline, you know, and and so forth. And talking about discipline, I do think there's another curse, which is and which is very much related to money, right? It's like, oh, I made it and I, I worked so hard for my whole life, or just I deserve it, you know, because my family's been poor for quite a while and now I'm gonna go spend it on jewelry and parties and making really stupid decisions. Next thing we know, they're in the media beating their wives and so forth, and they lose their whole their whole boat, you know, with the treasures and, and all of that. So I think I think you know, talent will only take you thus far. And I do think that they need to ha- handle pain for, for quite some time, even before to, to start enjoying a little bit their fortune. I, I mean, it doesn't mean to take it to an extreme and never spend any dime of your fortune on stuff you love, but I, I think that's like a 
a low hanging fruit, a poison fruit uh, for them to to enjoy too quick. Do you often see that in your athletes? Yeah, I think a lot of times you get, you know, and you have to, you know, we see these athletes on TV and they're doing interviews with, you know, big time media publications. And oftentimes we forget that, you know, they're 19, 20, 21 year old kids that all of a sudden have a huge influx of money. And, you know, depending on who is surrounding them, they can make some bad decisions, right? And like you mentioned, their time in the league, you know, I had a coach tell me just the other day that if you if you take out in the NFL, the top 10 percent uh, of the um, longevity wise in, in the league. So like the time Tom Brady's and the guys that have have been in there for a very long time. Right. The, the average stay in the NFL actually shrinks from three and a half years to like less than 12 months. And so this window that you have is is so short, right? So I think it goes back down to, you know, I saw an interesting study the other day. There were 11 companies um, that were being studied and it was over 48,000 hours worth of, uh, you know, worth of work that they, you know, that they studied, right? So, I mean, do the math on that. That's like, like maybe... 10 plus years of, of, you know, data that they collected. And they said, Hey, if you as a individual sit, um, you know, sit within 25 feet of a top performer, your performance will increase 15%. But on the flip side, if you sit within 25 feet of a poor performer, your performance will go down 30%. And so if we then take that into athletics, we look at, you know, like a Michael Jordan, right? And the players that played with him that, yes, they got championships. But if you look at the points that they averaged per game, it was higher with him than when they played without him, right? And so it goes to show that the crowd that you surround yourself with uh, makes a difference. And so if you're an athlete, regardless of the level, if you start hanging around with people that think a little bit differently than you, think bigger than you, own businesses, um, those sorts of individuals, they will help your decision-making process and and you will think differently about how to use money, your sporting career, the types of activities that you get involved with, all of that type of stuff. So it, it it really goes to the who who do you take advice from? Who is the core that you hang around? And are you um, seeking to be around better, more influential people uh, that can help you down the road, make you think bigger? Or are you going to be drugged back by you know the people that they don't have the talent? Yeah, they might come from the neighborhood that you came from, but are they really the best people to be associating with? And so I think it, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. And I think when you have these athletes that they blow a lot of the money, it's because of that, that group that they surround themselves with that um, it's dragging them back uh, versus pushing them forward. Which is like really hard decisions. You know, they're, they're hard decisions because, us humans, although most of us don't want to admit it, we're very much emotionally involved in pretty much everything. It's like, oh, if I let them go, you know, that then this I let, I'm letting go of a part of me, and that's really, really painful. So tough decisions pretty much all the time. Then who do you trust? Who do you not trust? You know, do you feel you let them down if you don't hang out with them? Or once you you've made it as an athlete, if you don't send them their checks anymore, you know, like it's yeah. like, yeah, I made it. And now it's my duty to support them. Very, very hard decisions. Um, it also made me think quite a lot. I didn't know that the lifespan was that short in the NFL. This is really extreme, you know, even if they get paid quite a lot, let's call it 500 K minimum to yeah, five mil a year. I mean, yeah, that's not a lot considered they last like 12 months or five years. So quite extreme. And then came to my mind, um, you know, I have my theory that life is is all about, there's a nice equilibrium. So the more pain that you have, the more you invest, the more you'll get as a return. So my, my thinking was choose your sports, but then it's like, oh, 
you're Earl Woods choosing golf for your kid. First, there's ethical implications to discuss there, but that apart, if all the kids in the neighborhoods are playing basket, I mean, it's a low hanging fruit to have your kid play basket. It's almost natural, right? Um, but Earl Woods, for example, he was one of the only uh, father to have his son, uh, his black son play golf, you know? Um, and that was really, really, really contrarian back in the the 80s. Uh, but guess what? You know, like Tiger's making like a billion per year almost nowadays. And yeah. he's like probably one of the most successful um, athletes. And I've recently watched, you know, the Air uh, movie with uh, Nike with, with Jordan. They should definitely make one with Tiger because I think Tiger has been the most impactful Nike athlete. Um, so what do you think about that thesis? Shouldn't like... Uh, people and parents that didn't make the ethical decision to like go all in with their, their, their sons, like study, like what sport is growing out there and the kind of investment they should make with their son. And what are the ethical implications to that? When you somewhat see your, your son or your daughter as not an ATM, but you know, you see it as an investment. And, and by the way, that's how society was built. People had kids, so that their kids would take care of them later on in, in their lives. But what do you right. think about all of that? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, that raises a lot of points that we could probably spend a day talking about it. Right. I think um, the, what people miss in some of the tiger and the Earl uh, is that tiger liked playing golf. I mean, he gravitated to the sport. Right. And so I think where you run into problems is when, the the kid doesn't want to or isn't into a particular sport yet the parent is pushing them to play that sport right and i and i don't know that it's um you know it, it, and you see that with burnout right i mean you see a lot of kids getting to college and they're just they're done they're done playing their sport they don't care about it and they could have all the talent in the world and you know, it, it, they're just, they're over it. And it's because of the, the constant, uh, that's all they ever did as they were growing up. They didn't, they weren't allowed to, to, um, you know, look at any other interests. Right. And all the way down to the specialization where, you know, when, when I was growing up, you played, you played football, basketball, baseball, it wasn't football year round. It wasn't basketball year round. It wasn't baseball year round. You broke it up. Right. And um, so I think it's, it's it's being it. And but then you balance that with as a parent, you see a child that has a talent in a specific thing. And, you know, where is the line where you're where you're pushing them in a healthy way? to pushing them in an unhealthy way, because, you know, as, as, a, as adults, we know more than our kids. Right. And we're, we're there to parent, not just be, you know, their best friends. Right. And so it's, it's definitely a fine line. Um, and I think it's, it's allowing them to develop, you know, interests and have those things where it's not their 24 seven working on their sport. Cause Obviously, I'm different in my case, but I would really come with a deep analysis um, function of the sport. Me, I have the luxury to choose where I want to be in the world. But let's say that I'm in uh, this municipality in California. I would analyze, OK, is there a sports center that I can uh, have my kid practice in? Are they world class? You know, um, if they are world class, then I, I might have them do that. Obviously, there's my own passions, but it would also come in, in the calculus their health you know football uh -uh. like their poor little brain you know like first they, yeah. they'll have impact um in short age and then you know like if they go pro man it's a disaster the injury rate in in football it's it's literally suicide so obviously golf is a bit more healthy um tiger yeah really successful case study in terms of money but the guy still had a lot of demons as well so that there's this to factor in but I tried to analyze also like the, the growth rate of the sport. Is it lacrosse? Um, MMA, I mean, it's it's growing. It's it's fantastic. It's spectacular. But yeah, the injury rate again. So I think I, I tried to to choose a sport that's fully aligned that I, I would build a spreadsheet, rate it and and have it in there. If I want to create my little athlete, which is still a very much of a, an ethical concern, right? Like, yeah, especially with my type of personality, it's like, okay, you 
first you you're going to be an, an, an entrepreneur you don't have a choice on that one and then second yes uh, being an athlete I, I do strongly believe in that not only for the career part of it but the the skill set that they might build right so yeah there, there's still there's still that question but um let, let me ask you this like how much where's the where's the fine line between imposing something on on your children uh before the age of 18 um being kind of their their tutors if you want and and letting them do their own things because it i i still haven't got like a, a an answer asking many folks about that one like how can you influence a kid like what what i mean if if Tiger got interested in golf because he used to see his father play golf in the garage. So the question is like, did Earl impose that on him? You know, he was, he was constantly like driving balls in, in, in front of Tiger. So obviously there's going to be a psyche effect to that. And I think that was his intention. Do not underestimate Earl. He was a military man. Yeah. I, I believe <laughs> even a green Barrett. So really OCD, really obsessed, tough man, you know, um, So what's the fine line with that, especially when you you have like finance in into it, right? Um, do you see that often as a problem or or let let me ask you that or or do you see that like most parents have that one under control? You know, I think it's it's a case by case basis, right? Because each child is different and and each parent is different and and so, you know, you coach your kids differently right it's not the same method for for each of them and and you know it, it's interesting because we talk golf and we see the numbers that these guys are making you know the top guys that are making now but tiger's the really the one that brought that to golf so it was it was more of yeah could he at that time when he was going pro have made a living playing golf and a pretty good living Yes, absolutely. But I don't think anybody thought that, hey, he's going to become a billionaire doing this, right? Because that wasn't the monetary, the financial system that golf was was under at that time. So I think, yeah, there was there was definitely, you know, Earl enjoyed playing golf, but Tiger also enjoyed playing golf. And it was something that he would do on his own outside of that, right? And so then it's, all right, I think in a case like that, Yeah, you can push your your son, especially when he's on TV at four years old, you know, driving the ball, uh, you know, however far, right? I mean, he definitely had a talent. And so there's something there that as a parent you can nurture. Um, and but if your kid, you know, is is, you know, like I'll take my son, as much as I would love him to play sports, right? And and I choose, I would choose golf for him as well, not because I would care if he ever went pro but because I know that that's a life skill, right? And so it's whatever he gets into, you know, being able to golf with people and CEOs and to, and to be good at it is going to benefit him throughout his life. And, you know, but he has an interest in science. And so, you know, as much as I would love to just push him into golf, like to me, it's more important for us to have a good relationship, right? And who knows, he may cure cancer. I I, I don't know what he's going to, uh, what he's going to do. Uh, but still golf could help him in that, right? It can make oh, yeah. the right connections. And so it's, um, it's just understanding and seeing where their, their interests are gravitating towards and knowing when you're fighting a losing battle and, and to take a step back. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, you know, and I think it's hindsight, right, is it's it's more important, at least for me, to have a good relationship ongoing with my with my uh, my kids than to have them be super successful in a sport that they may not actually like and have them resent their childhood years uh, as as a result of that. I'm really bullish on golf as well. I talked uh, to Gan my podcast about golf innovation. You know, like uh, you bring four CEOs on the on the golf course. You can make content out of that. You know, you can mastermind, um, and it, the sport itself, right? Like have a some drones film you and so forth, and have prizes to win. You know, like that. I'm really really bullish on golf. I actually started my 
professional career, uh, well, professional, the, my first job was working on a golf course for four years. And yeah, I'm quite bullish on it. It's a nice um, opportunity to show your skills as well, you know? So yeah, yeah I think I'd buy, you know, these Mercedes printer and I I do like a, a podcast content hybrid and I'd stop at every city and I'd say, look, CEO, I'm, I'm in your city. I'm organizing a force. I'm there. Stop by, you know, it's free. And yeah, let's connect. And uh, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, was making most of his presidency on the field, making deals, which I think is, is somewhat of a good thing. Um, so quite bullish on golf as well. Plus, it's somewhat low impact, low injury. Uh, you get to walk in nature, breathe the fresh air, you know, super sport Absolutely. and get sun yeah. exposure. Um, where can people find out more about you, Ryan? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, a must win, uh, www.amustwin.com. Um, our programs are, you know, on success beyond game day.com and Instagram. I'm, uh, at a must dot win. 